Hello everyone, my name is Joe Scorson, channel is called Ethernet Link, and today is day 13th, day 13th of the Quant Finance Advert to Code. We get a Friday the 13th, kind of fun. Um, yeah, this is going to be the second advanced strategy video that we're going to do. The last one was about the Hearst Exponent, and I wanted these strategies to not necessarily be about machine learning because everybody wants to do machine learning now, like it's a new, like it's a trendy thing, I guess, but I wanted to kind of show you guys some stuff that you might not even know exists and it's not your fault because people just don't talk about it too much. Who talks about the Hearst exponent? Who talks about Garch models? Which is what we're going to be doing in this video. Um, we're going to hop right into it, but the reason we're doing Garch models in this video is because uh, we're going to make a mean reversion strategy. We're going to go over nuances in that and uh, results and back tests to show why to use a mean reversion strategy sometimes. But um, yeah, I just wrote a paper about Garch models for school. So it's fresh in my mind. We're going to get right into it. It'll be good. A um, few things. Thank you guys so much for all the growth on my X account. I wanted to get to 100 followers by the end of the year. It looks like I can get to get to 200. So that is absolutely amazing. Um, if you guys like to actively trade, my algo with, uh, with Lux algo might be something for you. If you guys like to trade on TradingView, it could be very helpful for you guys. Um, there's more videos about it on my channel and more details on the website. That'll be all be linked below. And if you guys want to get this code, it'll all be in this uh, Zero to Hero Advent of Code repo. If you guys want to see how to implement a neural network from scratch in C++, if you guys want to just do a bunch of other cool stuff, I'm going to be posting on my GitHub a lot more. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's hop into this code. So we're going to read our task first and then just get right into the code so that way you're not going back and forth. So our task is to implement a mean reversion strategy using a Garch 1-1 model. Um, there's different kinds of Garch models, so in case you guys wanted to research into it more, like this specific flavor is a Garch 1-1. Um, have a rolling window to use as a threshold of volatility, and plot results with Garch and the threshold. Cool. So if you guys remember in the last episode, I put this back tester into an object, to a class, whatever. And so that way, in our main, we could just give it the parameters and run all the back tests. Just super simple main. So... We're going to keep on going with that. Just remember to change the name of your um, strategy for your data. And yeah, I also just modified this. That way we can get the volatility threshold on our plot. But that's pretty much the only thing that's different. This simulate backtest function is exactly the same. If you want to backtest more than one thing, it might be good to change up um, the signal column to be specific to a certain strategy. So maybe you would say like, like Garch signal or something like that, just because I have one strategy in this code, I'm not going to do that, but yeah. Um, yeah, the only things that changed is these two functions right here. So let's go over our add Garch strategy first, and then I'll go over calculating it. So we're going to copy our data, get the log returns, drop the NA. Um, I like to do data equals data dot drop NA, um, or data gets. Um, it's just something mentally for me. I like to see that I do it. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, we got Garch params is calculate our Garch from our uh, log returns dot values. That'll be nice. That way we could treat it like an array. Um, then we get our omega, alpha, and beta from the Garch parameters. And then we can initialize our sigma squared, really, to be zeros. Initialize the first one to be the variance of the time series that we can build from there. And then calculate the conditional variances iteratively using the Garch formula. This is the Garch formula. Omega plus alpha times the log returns, the last log return, squared plus beta times sigma squared, the last one. Then our actual Garch will be just the square root of this. And then our volatility threshold will be a rolling window of the rolling mean, like a super moving average of that with the window that we are getting, that we are changing from all of our back tests. So that was a little chewy, but um, this formula will make more sense because I'm going to talk about it in way more detail in this function. So what is a Garch model? Right now that we got all that code out of the way, what is the Garch model? Uh, the acronym stands for a generalized, or just general, can't remember if it's general or generalized, but general, autoregressive, conditional, heteroscedasticity. That's the word for it. So general, you know, general. Autoregressive means that past values will influence current ones. Conditional means, you know, conditional. And heteroscedasticity means that the error of the variance of the model will change over time. It's under, it's it, um, inherently understanding that the model will perform better in certain areas of time than other ones. That's what that means. 
So we're going to maximize a log likelihood function in this. Why do we need to do this? Well, this omega, alpha, and beta are parameters that we need, but we need to estimate them. We need to estimate them pretty much by doing a newton Raphson step. Um, if you guys remember in the option pricing videos, the newton Raphson step to uh, estimate the implied volatility of an option, similar, um, similar idea here. So we're going to minimize a negative log likelihood function instead of maximizing an actual log likelihood function. Why are we going to do that? Because SciPy has a minimum function. And I don't want to do that code myself. I'll do all of this, but ah, coding Newton Raphson steps are just so annoying. So yeah, we're going to have our likelihood function in this function just because it needs to be, this is like an f of x, right? We're just, we're just defining that this is the function. So that way it's not just, it, it only has to exist in this function. It's the only place that we're going to use it. So might as well just put it in there. So now we have our initial parameters, our initial guesses, and we have bounds because, um, which one is it? I think alpha or omega and beta, one of these two added up together should be less than one. Can't remember off the top of my head, but that's why we set these bounds. So now our result is going to be minimizing the likelihood func the negative likelihood function with our function, the initial params and our bounds. And then we're going to return our parameters. If we have success or not, we're going to return these initial parameters. So let's go over this likelihood function for a second. So we have our params, which are these initial params right here, alpha, beta, omega, alpha, and beta. T is going to be the length of our returns. That's very important. Sigma squared, we're just going to initialize it. And then just like in the other function, the first value is going to be the variance of our overall returns. So now for one to um, T, you're going to do the same formula. So omega plus alpha times the last return squared plus beta times the last um, volatility value. And so then the likelihood is going to be this one half times uh, the sum of the log times pi times sigma plus returns squared, whatever return we're looking at over sigma squared. That is the likelihood. So now what SciPy will do kind of in the background for us is um, maxim minimize these values to get the smallest negative number here, which in turn maximizes it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much all that's going on right there because these alpha, um, these omega, alpha, and beta parameters represent how the variance acts in the time series over time. I believe the omega measure, I think, I believe that beta measures the long-term persistence of variance. Alpha measures the, um, how sensitive it is to recent shocks. And omega, I believe represents the error of the variance, something along those lines. I could be wrong about omega, but I believe I'm right about alpha and beta. Regardless though, that's the process that we're doing. And, um, it's a, hard to wrap your head around, but the actual formula in and of itself is pretty straightforward. I think, I don't think it's that, um, Hard to wrap your head around once you look at it for a little bit. I don't think it takes that long to understand, really. Could just be me. I did just write a whole paper on it. But there's worse, is my point. There is way worse um, stuff to do. But so, yeah, we're just going to uh, get our... We're going to get our alpha, beta, and omega from our parameters. And then we can go through and actually get our um, Garch volatility score. And so then we're going to get that score in a column. Get our volatility threshold, which is going to be a mean of that. Drop our NAs and then the same signals, right? So when our garch breaks, over, breaks above our threshold, I mean, we're previously below it, we're going to long it. And when we break below our volatility threshold, we're going to short it. And this should, um, this step right here is really the one I believe is the kicker because that's the shorting one. We're going to get into that. But that signifies that um, we should be trending back towards the mean because our volatility is decreasing. Volatility should increase when things go up. That is something that I don't think people talk about a lot. If you guys, um, if you guys can look up a, tr a chart of cocoa beans, cocoa bean futures, I have my trading view already set to something so that way we can look at it when the time comes. I think in the middle of 2022, like the start of 2023, might have the dates wrong. Cocoa beans like 5x. Yeah, it went up, but that was an incredibly volatile event. 
if somebody was trying to trade that, I'm sure it was a pain in the ass to get filled and let alone get filled where you want. That was a very volatile event, even though it went up. I believe that guards models capture that nuance very effectively. But yeah, that is the code. That's all we got to do. So if we simply run this, we're going to get, um, like before, we're just going to get a ton of, there we go. <laughs> we're going to get flashbanged a little bit and get a ton of different, um, um, back tests way quicker than the um, first exponent. So yeah, we have QQQ, Microsoft, and SQ. I forgot to mention that, but here is our guard volatility. And this is what I was meaning before. Volatility is going up as the stock is going up, which is absolutely stellar for my eyes as a quant to see that. Makes me very happy. But um, yeah, this is our strategy performance with the different thresholds. And so, yeah, even right here, stock is going down, volatility is going up. Very, thank you, <laughs> right? They can capture both is the point. So here we are going through the other thresholds. And so the QQQ one is a little meh, but now we're going to get into Microsoft. It was always um, a good one. And then the real best one in this is SQ. And we're going to get into this because this is a mean reversion strategy. Right, and so we're going to notice that this is pretty much from 2023 to um, 2024. And so SQ pretty much had the most consistent returns. And if we actually look at a chart for SQ, and this is my algo with Lux algo on it, no shame. Um, we can see that 2023 was a black luster year for it. Right, we had some, it closed green, but it had a very shitty start of the year, pretty much a lot of negative runs. Whereas you were, if you were to look at something like the QQQ um, in 2023, if I could find the date again, 2023 to 2024, yep, uh, had a great year. Had a great year trending up the whole time. And that was one of the names where the model struggled the most on uh, right here. The struggle the most on it had the biggest drawdowns and um, the lowest returns. Microsoft will take a look at it to see how our model, and this is daily, so the resolution is correct. Microsoft still went up, but had a few more troughs and stuff like that. Had this, um, had that move in the middle of the year right here, this kind of move down. It also went up in a bit of a slower methodical way than the QQQ. Um, so yeah, that's why we would have, um, such stellar performance on something like Microsoft or SQ specifically than something like triple Q on a mean reversion strategy like this one. I'm moving around my face a lot, but I want to make sure that you guys have, um, all the information that you'd like. So yeah. And you guys may notice that the Garch volatility isn't changing also. It'll just get shorter and shorter as we drop our NAs when we this um, when this threshold gets further back. But that's also the beauty of the Garch one one model is that like yeah you have the length of the time series, but that's what you go off is the entire time series is auto regressive. Um, that's another thing I think is awesome about this model is that it's fit. It's not overfit. It's not underfit. It's just fit. Um, so yeah. That's pretty much all the code I got for you guys today. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I think that Garsh models are awesome. We're actually, should I talk about Garsh models a little bit more? Um, I really think I got everything out there. We're not really using the eigenvalues in this um, context because if we were, okay, so here's another use case for you guys. We're going to talk about this here. I'm going to talk about this last thing and then I'm going to get out of here because here's another use case for you guys. We have these um, Garch values in our columns, right? For the entire time series. If you were to reconstruct a square matrix with rolling Garch models, you would have a matrix and you would be able to diagonalize that matrix. You would be able to get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, give them some given it's invertible and stuff like that. I believe it has to be invertible. But um, given you can, mathematically, you can get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and you can then diagonalize that matrix. And then with that diagonalized matrix, you could price things. 
you could price something like the VIX, your own little VIX, um, with that diagonalized matrix, um, giving you annualize the values correctly and discounted to present value. You could absolutely do that. That matrix would be very useful. There's a similar process to doing that for calculating the actual VIX. It's just not a garbage volatility model. It's the volatility from put options story for another day. But that is um, something I want to challenge you guys to do, right? You've learned a lot. You have the model right here. And we're going to talk about, we have a few more videos about portfolios and stuff like that, but brush up on your matrices, brush up on your linear algebra. I just finished the class, so I'm not going to look at it at all, but um, brush up on that stuff so that when we get, when we get to neural networks and stuff like that and support vector machines, I think I'm doing support vector machines. I really don't know, but um, you could follow along a little bit easy, a little bit easier, right? But um, yeah, Garch models, Garch models have a lot of different use cases. Another thing that you can do with Garch models that's not done here, but you can do, is there's a step in calculating this model or this value, where you could say sigma it right? Garch models can handle having multiple different components, multiple different independent components. That is also the point of them. So that way, this is only on one stock at a time. But if I were to want to group this on like QQQ, SPY, and IWM, I don't know, the big three indices, then each one could be represented independently from the other ones in our Garch model. That is a, um, you would obviously have to change the formula a little bit, but that is a, um, quality of this model is that you could do it on multiple different assets and they could all be represented in an uncorrelated way. So that way they could all be represented and you can get a better broad market picture. So if you wanted, if you had enough time, computing power and care, um, you could do it for the entire S and P 500. And so then you would get a better view of the S and P 500 volatility than if you were to just do it on spy, because it's something like AVGO is up 22% today, pretty damn, pretty damn volatile. And Microsoft is down. I think Microsoft is flat. I don't think it's down right now. But you get the point. Microsoft is weighted way higher in the S&P than Avco. But you would get a better view of overall broad market volatility if each one of those was represented independently. And that's something that Garch models can handle if set up for them. In this code, they're set up for just a single, single stock. But modify it. Go crazy, right? That's the whole point of this series is that you guys can see different ways to do stuff. I hope that not a lot of you guys knew about Garch models, so you got to learn something new. Or the Hearst Exponent, honestly. But yeah, in the next video, what we're going to be doing is simulating both strategies trading at the same time, so that way we can know which strategy to maximize and minimize. And then um, you could do some linear programming for that, I bet. We're not going to get into that right now. But um, you're gonna, we're going to do that. We're going to get some portfolio metrics on them. We're going to stress test a portfolio. And yeah, that'll be pretty much it. So... I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Hope that you guys are enjoying the series. Hope that you guys are following along well. Hope that I'm explaining everything good enough. And I hope that you guys are just crushing it every day with these challenges or whenever you guys get around to it. Um, yeah, that's all for this video. Check out the links in the description. Check out the GitHub to get the code. And I'll catch you guys all in the next one. Ciao, ciao.